Welcome to the Melodology Podcast, celebrating the unsung excellence of melody makers. My name is Arthur Brewer. I am a composer. I am your host. And we are here today to talk about another amazing melody. My guest today is composer Tamson Jones. Tamson Jones is an award winning UK composer and an associate lecturer at the International Center for Music Studies at Newcastle University. Born in the West Midlands, Tamson studied at Newcastle University and the University of Birmingham before pursuing a career in singing and teaching. She established herself as a composer with the release of her album Of a Rose in 2017, recorded by the one-man choir Matthew Curtis. A series of awards followed, including the NIPOS, N-I-P-O-S, Czech Arts Council, Choral Composition Competition, and the inaugural Spark Competition. Tamsin is renowned for her choral compositions, particularly Noel Verbum Caro Factum Est, which has been published in the groundbreaking Multitude of Voices anthology and has been performed across the UK, Europe, and Canada. Her diverse commissions include works for Celtic harp and a miniature ballet for Western instruments and gamelan. Welcome to the Melodology podcast, Tamsin. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Let's start with some early memories of music. Okay, well, I think my first serious involvement in music was in my local parish choir um, when I was about seven, eight, nine years old. It's difficult to remember. It's so long ago now. And I was in the choir only for a short time, and I didn't really progress to anything from it, but it really made an impression on me. It instilled in me a love of choral music. And I think the things that really stuck with me is the memory of preparing for Christmas in that first year that I was there, singing all the traditional carols. I remember that I particularly liked um, We Wish You a Merry Christmas, especially the bit about we all want figgy pudding. And <laughs> I also liked the really gentle carols, such as um, the sort of Czech one, Sing Lullaby, and Hush Do Not Wake the little child. And I, I just loved the, the gentleness of that. And David Wilcox's very subtle harmonies. And um, so even though I was only in this choir for a very short time, that still made a mark on me. And it, it came to be that I got into choral music again as I became an adult. And I then started composing choral music and pursuing that as my main research interest um, at university. And that is really what I do, although I do do other things as well, such as keyboard music and some orchestral compositions. So it's amazing, just a little seed can often, often really take root in your heart and then become a lifelong love of music. Oh, absolutely. And I, I think it's a shame when music is put down as an item in education when it's considered to be superfluous because music really operates in our brain differently than other things and it includes math and history and Definitely. storytelling and all these different things that are involved in music that wrap around every other topic that you can possibly imagine and when that's taken out of education i think it's a huge loss uh, not only for our culture but for people's development you mentioned some different songs from when you were in choir, what are your earliest memories of any particular melodies? I think possibly when I was very, very small, I used to like watching a thing called Camberwick Green. It's really going back a bit and it was like a puppet show type thing. And there was also a show called Bagpuss, which was about a cloth cat in this, it's, kind of set in the Edwardian era. And there's this little girl called Emily who has a cloth cat called Bagpuss. And Emily has a shop. And in this shop, there are various items that people have lost. And the idea is that um, they're displayed in the window. And then if the owner comes past and sees something that they've lost, then they can go into the shop and get it back. And Bagpuss belongs to Emily. Perhaps he might have been lost by somebody else at some point, but there are various other toys, such as a woodpecker called Professor Yaffle, and there's the marvellous mechanical mouse organ, which is a kind of um, 
pipe organ with little mice carved onto it. And there's Madeline, the rag doll. And of course, Gabriel, the toad. And Gabriel has a banjo. And when people are not looking, Bagpuss will wake up. That's it. Now I remember. So when Emily says a certain incantation, Bagpuss will wake up. And when Bagpuss wakes up, all the other toys wake up as well. And then they have various adventures, usually involving some item that has been brought into the shop for repair. But I remember the theme tune went something like this. Ba-dum, bum, ba, ba-dum, bum, dee, ba-dum, do, 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 do. Now, that always stuck with me because it was very sentimental sounding. And it always used to make me cry because Bagpuss would have to go back to sleep again. Oh. And I think that the show was really a very subtle way of teaching young children that everybody has to die eventually because you you wake up and you live. But then when Bagpuss becomes tired and falls asleep, then they all have to fall asleep. And so it used to make me feel this sort of joy when Bagpuss comes alive, but also great sadness when he had to go back to sleep again. And it was that melody captured that sort of bittersweet feeling really strongly for me. However, the interesting thing is that I came <coughs> later to work at Newcastle University and a recently retired member of staff was a lady by the name of Sandra Kerr. And it turns out that she provided the voice of Madeline from Bagpuss. And I remember she gave a discussion lecture all about the show, and she was explaining some of the origins. And apparently the tune that I've just sang is actually a Northumbrian folk song that she adapted for the purposes of the show. Now, I currently live in Newcastle-upon-Tyne in the Northumbria area, so it's very local to where I am now. So I think that's really, really sweet. That's beautiful. And I, I am going to look and see if we can find that. And if I can find anything on YouTube, examples of that, or if we can find that theme, we will include links down in the show notes, because that just sounds sounds like it's too good to pass up, especially as it's another melody that we can talk about and we can look at, or at least we can share it. And people will now also hear that nostalgia that you're talking about in that melody. What are some of your favorite classical pieces of music? And when I say classical, I mean broad classical, everything from Renaissance up through contemporary classical music? My current um, favorite composer, it's difficult to pick favorites because there's so many wonderful composers from all periods. But I think the person that I turn to the most is Josquin de Pré, the um, early 16th century French composer. And I'm also very interested in the 17th century German composers Heinrich Schütz and Michel Pretorius. And in terms of contemporary composers, I suppose that I admire very much Arvo Part, because of all contemporary composers, I think Arvo Part's accomplishment is the most singular and most memorable, because he has come up with a highly original way of composing that is accessible, that is diatonic, and yet utterly distinctive. And I think to come up with the tintinabuli approach to composition, something so subtle and yet so simple, and to write such memorable pieces as Spiegel im Spiegel, Fioralina, and the Cantus in Memoriam Benjamin Britten, and also the Magnificat, I think those pieces utterly unforgettable. And so I really greatly admire Arvo Part. Also, I have a Slightly mixed feelings about, but I generally admire the recently passed away John Tavener, another British composer. Arvo Part, of course, is Estonian, but um, a compatriot of mine, um, John Tavener. He also had a very interesting style and wrote some very beautiful pieces, such as The Lamb and the um, song for Athene, which was sung at the um, funeral of Princess Diana 25 years ago. So I think. If you count him as a contemporary composer, even though he passed away um, several years ago, I think also I admire much of his music as well. Although I do find it's more of a mixed bag for me. And 
I think of all living composers are very part. And also I think um I have a liking for Eric Whitaker because again he has come up with a really distinctive style. Because many composers currently in, in choral music especially um write in a kind of return to diatonic, straightforward tonality, but with added sonorities, typically an added second, added ninth, sometimes um the 11th sounded against the 3rd to get a somewhat shimmery kind of sound. But I think what really distinguishes Whittaker's style is that he takes this up to 11. So he piles <laughs> yes. in the added tones. So other composers maybe add one tone to the harmony, which aids clarity. But Whittaker adds two or three tones. And yet, somehow... And I wish I knew how he does it. He still manages to, to keep a crystal clear sense of harmonic direction. Right. So I think that's really interesting and really admirable. Although, strangely enough, I think of all the pieces by Whitaker that I, I like, it's his kind of almost a pastiche of the style of Monteverdi Madrigal, which is um, Leonardo dreams of his, his flying machine. And that is just such a mind-blowing piece. <laughs> and the way it sort of becomes, it kind of morphs from this kind of evocation of 17th century madrigalistic music. And then towards the end, you have these sound effects and this depiction of flight. Yeah, that I'm going really to have works. to include all of these as links so people can enjoy them. Yeah, it's a great uh, and you piece. did mention diatonic and accessible as terms. For the folks listening to the podcast who may not be familiar, diatonic basically is the normal scales that we are familiar with, major minor scales. Those are diatonic music. And accessible is a term that it's not a perfect fit for what it really mm -hmm. means when we're using it right here, because it also has the definition in terms of being accessible culturally or being accessible financially and things like that. So accessible in this instance, the way we're using the word, we're talking about it being something that somebody can remember the melody, somebody sound maybe sounds familiar. It's something that's easy for somebody who isn't necessarily educated in lots of music or exposed to different styles of music. It is accessible to them in the in the way that they can approach it and they can listen to it and they can they wouldn't find it too much of a stretch to be able to appreciate that music because a lot of music is very challenging. And Indeed. a lot of music, even classical music, there's a lot of music without having to go into different tonalities and things like that. There's a lot of music that is very challenging to listen to. And accessibility in this case basically means something that is approachable and relatively digestible, I guess is another good word for it. Oh. It's or another bad word for it. Digestible in terms of music doesn't necessarily sound that appealing. I will try and include links to those different pieces of music because they there's a lot of really amazing music that you mentioned. And a lot of it is it's it's not composers or styles that we've necessarily talked about or shared on the podcast before. So I think those will be really good to include in the show notes for our listeners to to do a little bit of exploring of other music. Let's go ahead and move into the melody we're going to be talking about. When you brought this to my attention, I know I have heard this music before, but it's not a melody that I would consider you know, something that I can think of. If you mention the title to me, I wouldn't be able to just start humming this piece of music. Tell us about this piece of music that you have brought to the podcast today. Okay, so the piece that I would like to talk about is called Innsbruck, Ich muss dich lassen, which means Innsbruck. I must now leave you. And it's a song about the pain of leaving somewhere that you really love, about having to leave behind a loved one. So the lyricist of Innsbruck is addressing his wife or lover and commending her to God's protection while he has to go away for some reason. But he also looks forward to returning and seeing her again. And this melody appeals to me very greatly because I think it's more than the sum of its parts. It's a very simple melody, but a very well-constructed one. And it's in the major key, and yet it has an air of poignancy, an air of sadness about it. And I find 
that as one who has traveled a great deal in my life, I find that this idea of having to leave places behind, people behind, but with the hope of seeing them again, I can really relate to this. Mm. And I think it's just a really beautiful, memorable melody. And it's that sort of bittersweet quality. So when I was talking about the Bagpas theme, in my mind, it associated both with the joy of watching the show and seeing the toys coming alive, but also a sense of sadness knowing that they'd go back to sleep again at the end of the show. And it's that sort of two emotions in one. So there's a really strong sense of regret and sadness at having to leave this beautiful city of Innsbruck behind, but also a hope that one day of returning to it. So tell us about the history of this melody. Okay. So it's usually attributed to the 15th and early 16th century Flemish composer Heinrich Isaac. And he worked in Innsbruck in the 1580s before going on to employment in Florence. So he, he himself had to leave the city for employment reasons. And as I say, the tune is attributed to him, but it may simply have been a folk melody that he heard and then harmonized. But it appeared in print about 20 so years after his death. So he died in 1517, and it was published in 1539 in a collection of songs called Teutsche Liedlein, which means Little German Songs. Mm. And there are many such songs in it, and this collection was put together by a chap called Johannes Petraeus, an early publisher of music in Germany. And incidentally, he was also the person who first published the theories of Copernicus about the solar system. So a very big kind of cultural connection. It is an example of what is called a discant lead. So the melody is put in the discantus, which is an archaic term for the high voice, the soprano voice, and then it is supported by alto, tenor, and bass parts. Well, let's go ahead and take a break, and we will come back and listen to and look at this melody. Okay. Welcome back to the Melodology Podcast, celebrating the unsung excellence of melody makers. I am your host, Arthur Brewer, and I am here today with guest composer Tamson Jones. We are talking about a melody that is different from the other melodies we've talked about in the podcast so far. This melody, I think, is a little bit, or at least the presentation of it, is a little bit older than other melodies we've talked about. So I would like to go ahead and share the choral work, the choral arrangement of this piece, so people can hear it in context. And then we'll go back and look at the melody. So this is a little different than we've done it before, but it will give you a context of what it is that the actual melody fits into. So let's go ahead and listen to this first. is a beautiful choral arrangement, and I would consider it an older style of arranging the notes. It feels like it's more Renaissance. Am I, am I correct in saying Absolutely. it would be a Renaissance Absolutely. sort of vocal arrangement? And just listening to that, you feel that age to it. And one of the neat things about it is you have the parts where the different lines, the different people singing are repeating things that the other line has said or using the same little melodies or motifs at different times 
to keep it more interesting while one person's holding a note, another person's moving and so forth. So let's take a look at the melody itself. Okay. As we do this, we're walking along the melody as if we've never seen it before and looking for what we find along the way. If you would like to see what it is we're talking about, the podcast does have a Patreon. And if you are a member of our Patreon, you can see this on video. So you'll be able to see the notes as we're talking about them. So let's go ahead and look at just the first phrase of this melody. So just in that first phrase, what are we seeing so far? So first of all, it's a very graceful, smooth kind of melody. So you'll see that it largely moves by step. So the very first gesture, Innsbruck Igmus, just three notes by step. Then Mm -hmm. there's a little bit of a skip, but then those rising three notes are balanced by the falling three notes in step. So there is balance, three rising pitches, F, G, A, and then three descending pitches, C, B flat, A. And the only leap that we have in there is a leap from one note of the chord to another note of the chord, if we're talking about the tonic chord here. And that, of course, makes it easier to go more than a step because you have a more solid place to land Definitely. when you're getting to the next note. I do like the balance with the three notes up, three notes down. Speaking in terms of somebody almost like announcing a game that we're watching, I'm curious to see if this same motif is going to be used elsewhere later on in the piece, the three notes up, the three notes down. One thing I noticed listening to it before is it isn't what we would think of as a popular melody nowadays where there's short phrases and short motifs that repeat multiple times the same way. This seems to have a lot of difference as we're going along through it. I'll play through the first phrase and then continue in through the second phrase. And we can hear how it continues from there. So what's happening here? Okay, so again, this is very smooth. Just a little bit more by way of skips, but never very large ones. And just as the first phrase of the melody covered the space of a third, F, G to A, and then C, B flat to A, in the same fashion, this portion of the melody also emphasizes the interval of a third. So, ich fahr du hin. And another connection with the previous phrase is the way that Lassen has a falling contour that really fits the German very well. So does Strassen. So this is Lassen and then Strassen. So that's poetic in terms of the way that we would say it, but it's also melodically doing the same thing. You have a downward step on both of those points, and they're also rhythmically at the same point in the phrase. The rhythm is a little different between the two phrases, because in the first one, we have steady notes going up the first three notes. And then the second phrase, we've added a dotted rhythm, which adds a little bit more interest, but it really is essentially the same structure as far as the same number of notes. We have one melody that's kind of going up and another one that's definitely going back down. We've gone as high up as the fifth of the melody, landing on the third, and then again we go up to the fifth and we go all the way back down to the leading tone, one step below our home note. Absolutely. And yes, I mean, it's very interesting that you refer to the rhythm because that dotted note on Ich fahr dohin, that just adds just a touch of energy. So it has been moving in a very placid, sedate way, but then the dotted note just gives that little drive forwards. And the other thing is that um, the melody, as you say, has this very clear sense of direction, rising to the fifth and then falling to the third. 
and then falling from the third to the leading turn. So it's got a sense of where it's going, but it's not a straight line. So it's not just sort of walking in a straight heading. Instead, Isaac just takes a little bit of a detour. It curves towards its destination. In other words, it makes a kind of S-shaped line. And looking at this, this put me in mind and something that I read about William Hogarth, the 18th century um, British painter and engraver. And he had this idea that um, there was such a thing as the line of beauty. The idea being that this is a slightly S-shaped line shows both direction and purpose, but also interest because it doesn't go there straight away. It takes a little bit of a detour and this intrigues the viewer. And this is an S-shaped line. And then I looked at it in just a little bit more detail and found that actually the idea has been around for quite a while. And so going back to almost contemporary with Heinrich Isaac was, of course, Donatello. And just possibly they may have bumped into each other. So I see that um, Donatello died in 1486. I think that is around the time that Isaac went to Florence. So who knows? Maybe Isaac might have bumped into the elderly Donatello. I don't know. But the thing here is that Donatello developed this S-shaped curve and in his sculptures, there's such a thing as the figura serpentinata, this idea of having a human figure that shows a kind of rotation. And this gives a great deal of life and dynamism. So this is an aesthetic connection that I'm very interested to explore in my future researches. Something I'm noticing here as well, we've talked about melodies where the lyrics are talking about finding something or going someplace. And those melodies, very often they avoid getting to the home note, or at least they avoid getting to the home note on the home chord so that you have this final stability. Starting here in these two phrases, we're starting out at home. We're starting out right on the first note of the scale and then going away from it. So yeah. in terms of the theme of the music, the notes of the music are technically doing the same thing, which may or may not have been intentional. Don't know if this was written as a piece of music that had these words to it, or if the words came after, or if the words came before, however that works. But in this case, the melody does fit well with the message that the melody is saying. Absolutely. One of the things I find really appealing about it as an arrangement as a whole is that even though it is strongly modal, that is part of its appeal. So in the four-part harmonization, one of the most striking things is that E-flat chord. So the chord on the flattened seventh, which really belongs to the Mixolydian mode. And that sounds really very striking to modern ears. And that is part of the appeal of it. But that precedes a very modern sounding half cadence to the dominant. So as well as having these archaic modal qualities, Isaac is also exhibiting a forward-looking sense of tonal structure. So as you say, the melody is kind of longing to return home. And it's also like a quest to get back to that F when the journeyer finally comes back to his sweetheart living in Innsbruck. Let's go ahead and play the first three phrases now and see what else we're finding as we go through. We have a very different line here, and I'm going to just play that new phrase. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and play through, I guess it's the next two phrases in terms of this, the length of the structure. So here are the next two phrases. The first thing I notice in that fourth phrase is we have a return to the step down on the last two notes. But in this third phrase, it's completely different than what's come before it. 
Yes, both in the character of the melody and also the notes. But again, there's a subtle connection. In Fremdeland, oh him. There's that third again. Da, Fremdeland, yeah, so we're going down and we have, you know, three steps down. And from that bottom note, it's technically three steps back up. So there's definitely staying within a third and staying with stepwise motion. And you also have another S-shaped curve. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, a perfect perfect S there. And the other thing is that um, compared to the long note values of the preceding two phrases, this has an almost matter-of-fact quality about it. And I think it gives a really clear sense of point and articulation to the melody. So you have two quite lengthy phrases, and then just to tidy everything up, there's this very brief phrase in quicker note values. And also, again, it finishes on the second degree of the scale. So again, we're still longing to get back home. We're not getting there yet. And the previous phrases each had essentially three measures, you know, as far as the length of them, or if we add a half measures on either side, you know, we've got three full measures. And this one, this one little spot here, the reason that I continued playing it was as I was thinking of looking at it, I was thinking, well, we haven't gotten to a third measure yet, so it can't be over. So the phrase there is a shorter phrase. It's not actually in an exact poetic structure with all of the lines being exactly the same length in terms of measures. Very often in popular music and in classical music, you'll have phrases that are the same length. And just like you would have a poem with the same rhythm in every single line, you can have music where you have the same number of measures and each set of measures is a phrase. In this case, we have a shorter phrase. Yeah, and I think that adds to the appeal of the composition because it's almost as if Isaac is is just teasing us a little bit. So he's giving us two long phrases and then a short phrase just to tie up the first half of the melody. So far, I've talked a lot about the balance of the melody, but now this is something that is not quite balanced. And so that slight asymmetry, I think, just gives that little bit of appeal. So if you look at something that is perfectly symmetrical, yes, it's beautiful, but if you just have a little bit of asymmetry or a little bit of imperfection, dare I say, that can have an appeal of its own. So I think the Japanese refer to it as wabi-sabi, this idea of finding beauty in irregularity, beauty in the broken, beauty in that which doesn't quite fit. And then the fourth phrase is almost exactly the same as the first phrase. It just starts on the second note instead of starting on the first note. Uh -huh. So you do have this call back. You have a repeat of the very first phrase in a way after you've had this little straying into someplace different. And I'll note that that starting with the second note of the scale, it then turns the melody into another S-shaped curve. Mm. But it is, it's a repeat. It's three steps up, three steps down, exactly the same notes as in the first phrase. I'll just play just that part right now so you can hear that. So we've got to call back to that first phrase again. That's the introduction to the whole melody. And that introduction to the melody comes back. So we have exactly the same thing that makes it easier to remember, gives it its identity. After that, we then have a repeat of what came before as well. So after that phrase, we have the same B phrase. And then this is where things become different. So we've had the first two phrases essentially repeated the same way as they were at the beginning. And now we have what I would say is new material coming up, but everything looks to be following the same sort of patterns. Let's listen to this last phrase of the piece. So 
So what do we see here? All right. So first of all, the repeat of those first two phrases imposes a sense of structure. So we have A, B, then C is that short little phrase. And then we go back A, B again. So now we have a repeat, which supplies structure. But then Isaac ties up the melody with a, a beautiful bow with this D phrase. As you can see, again, it has a strong sense of direction about it. It rises and then falls again, finally reaching the home point, the F, the modal tonic. But this is where it's really subtle and interesting for several reasons. First of all, we've had, with the one exception of the dotted note, we've had a rather placid melodic rhythmic structure, but now the rhythm accelerates and gains in intensity. And in addition to this, the rhythm is parceled out in a very subtle way. So we have a grouping of three, vo, ich, im, and then a grouping of two beats on the e, and then it breaks into groupings of three. Da, 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 da. Then two again, and then three. Da, da, da. So the rhythm, the, the way the pulses are grouped, three, two, three, two, three, two. And that irregularity is absolutely fascinating. And again, although it rises and falls, it does have this slight kink in the curve. Da, 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 da. So it's an S-shaped idea once more. And there's more to it than that, because the word eiland means misery. And so this is the first time that we have an extended melisma on any one word. And I'm going to stop you right there and say what a melisma is. This is a place where one syllable in a word is given many notes. So, so far, every single syllable that's in the lyrics has had one note, one note to a syllable. And this spot in the melody, all of a sudden on the word misery, you have this long phrase of notes just on the word misery. Absolutely. And this kind of gives a sense of a kind of extended longing, a continuing pain. So I think that is very subtle, but there's still one more detail to draw out of this, which is if you look at the uh, melodic span, it goes from the E up to the B flat. It covers a triton, the forbidden Diablos in Musica, the devil in music. So this use of this dissonant melodic span E to B flat, I think also helps to convey the idea of misery and suffering. That interval is worth talking about again here because we've very often on the podcast talked about using a perfect fifth as a heroic sound or a perfect fourth, and they're called perfect because they are considered perfect intervals. They are actually in math, they are a mathematical ratio of one length of vibration or one speed of vibration to another. A fifth interval is the difference between two vibrations to three vibrations. So it, it's a mathematical connection between those. And a fourth is between three vibrations and four vibrations. But in this case, the, the interval we're talking about is the half step between a perfect fourth and a perfect fifth. And traditionally, this was considered, you know, it was considered <laughs> like an evil interval. It was considered a, you know, an interval that you would not use in harmonies and you would avoid the interval and in this case, we are going in the, the entire phrase, we are starting at the bottom of a tritone and moving up to the top of a tritone and then moving back down as far as the bottom of the tritone before finally moving back to our home note. Definitely. And the other thing is that um, you were talking about mathematical ratios. So I think the mathematical ratio for the tritone, I don't know it from memory, but it's something easy to look up. But the thing is, it's much more complex. So the perfect intervals have these simple ratios. Octave is two to one, and a fifth is three to two, a fourth is four to three, and so on. So the simplicity and clarity, but then with the tritone, it's much more complex and asymmetrical. And so it's harder 
to understand. And that, I think, is the reason behind its less easily approachable sound. But returning to the rhythm, the way that it divides up into twos and threes, this becomes much more apparent if we look at the actual source. So I have a screenshot of the publication from 1539 that I would like to share, and then you'll be able to see that this particular phrase, when you see it without bar lines, you can see it has a much more natural flow to it. So you can see that um, it's on the second line down, about midway towards the end, about two thirds of the way through. So you can see that the music and the text don't quite line up. Okay, so the joys of early music printing. <laughs> Well, and in this case, it's using a different clef. So we are looking at something where C is on the bottom line of the clef, and therefore the main note of the scale, which is the F, is shown in the second space. It's the fourth note up from the bottom line in this clef. So it's a little bit different than the notes we're looking at on the screen. So if you look on the second line toward the end of the second line, you have a note that starts on the second line of the staff, and that's the phrase that we're talking about. And yes, looking at it without everything else involved in it, you can see this beautiful symmetry going up and then kind of wandering back down, and you can see the structure, you can see the way that it's in twos and threes. Absolutely, and I think it's for this reason, that it's a good idea to go back to the sources and to see how they look, because using modern editions, it's too easy to get into the habit of thinking in terms of regular barring and grouping everything together, and you lose a lot of the subtlety and fluidity of the music. This is a useful corrective, I think. Yeah, and as a composer myself, I know that I create lines, and I will intentionally sometimes be tricky with the way that notes look, the order that they're in. And and then when you finally get that into the parts or into the score of the music, when you have it printed, you can lose a lot of the sort of beautiful symmetry that's in things, especially if something has to cross a line. You know, you jump from one staff down to the next staff, so your line is broken in two and all of that kind of mathematical or visual creativity that you've put into something no longer becomes as noticeable. And and sometimes, you know, there have been times when I've forgotten that I've done something and somebody points out and says, do you know you did this? I'm like, I, did I do that on purpose? I don't remember. Uh, it would be a good thing if we could find some convenient way of returning to this unbarred way of notating music. This is an example of proportional notation where the um, time signature doesn't tell you so much how many beats to a bar there are as the relative proportions of one note to another. So this is an example of a cut C. So the C is a way of showing that the breathe divides into two semi-breathes. And then from that, the two semi-breathes will divide into two minims each. And then if you put the cut through it, it shows that everything is then halved again. So it effectively moves quite quickly. And to go back and to define a few of those terms, breve uh, is also pronounced breve, and that's a whole note. It's four beats in our usual 4-4 four, four meter, what people think of as the most common meter, which is also C is referred to as common meter. And you can have four beats, and each beat is considered a quarter note, but it's a quarter of one whole note. And so in classical terminology, that's what you call that whole note. and when you're dealing with, again, a whole note, a half note, a quarter note, it's just how many beats are in comparison to that primary length of note, which is generally four beats unless you tell it otherwise. But with this proportional system, you can also set it so that you divide into threes if you wish to. So three was regarded as perfection, and then two is imperfect. And so the Time signature essentially tells you how one note value relates to another, and then everything is written without bars, and so we see the flow of the melody is just a continuous line, mm -hmm. and there's a great deal of, as I say, subtlety and ability to change, 
And this becomes much more apparent visually when you see the original notation. So for practicality, having modern barred editions is very helpful, but we do lose something of the feeling of the original music where we're simply relating one note to the next by the pulse and its relationship there too. What this notation doesn't show as well as modern notation does, what it doesn't show as well is where the emphasis lands in terms of time and in terms of the the destination, the arrival, and so forth. doesn't quite show that, which bar lines do a nice job of saying this is important or that's important in terms of where you are in a structure. Mm. Yeah, that is absolutely true. But again, this can be turned on its head because I think by the way that Isaac has set the melody, combining both the metrical accent and the tonic accent, I think he's actually kind of done all the hard work for us. So if we can return to the modern notation for a moment, you can see that those notes which have a naturally falling intonation, such as Bekumen, they fall. Bekumen, Strassen, Lassen, and so on. The note that is not emphasized, the syllable that is not emphasized, just falls away. And so he's kind of done that heavy lifting for you. And so, for example, in fremte land do hin, fremte, and then land do hin, and then the rising intonation of that suggests movement. And I think you don't actually need the bar lines with this one in order to see where the stresses fall. I would agree in this particular song, and also partly because of the fact that it, at the time the notation did not include that, adding the bar lines almost in some ways may create some misinterpretation of where there should be emphasis. Oh, definitely. So in this particular phrase here, wo ich im Eiland bin, I think if you observe the bar lines too rigidly, you do lose this subtle dividing into twos and threes that applies. And so my recommendation would be to try and pretend the bar lines aren't there and just to go with the natural flow of the melody. And you can see that Isaac has helpfully provided it with the tonic accent. Da, 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 da. So it rises to the next natural stress in, in the melody, and that helps to articulate it. And even as that melody is coming back down, it's gone stepwise up, and even as it's coming back down, it's giving emphasis to each note of the scale. It kind of jumps past the A, it gets up to the B flat and kind of jumps past that A, but it, it lands on the A before moving past the G and then back up to the G, then hits the F, emphasizes the F, but at this point we're at a chord that isn't the home chord yet. So you've landed on the F and you're almost there, but the harmony is telling you that you haven't gotten home yet. And then you move past that home note to the leading tone to the E, and then finally back up to land and be at home on that F. Precisely. And then what Isaac does is very simple. He simply repeats the phrase. And this provides balance in this fashion, because you've had phrase A, and then phrase B, then C, then the repeat of A and B. And so in order to match the repeat of A and B, and in order to balance the length of the parts, he simply repeats phrase D. And I suppose you could also think of it as a kind of echo effect. So if you sing the first phrase D slightly louder, and then the second phrase D at a lower dynamic, then this, I think, adds to the sense of poignancy by echoing. It really just displays a really good sense for balance, for structural design, and also for expressing the text. And I think all of these things are so very subtle and not immediately apparent. And yet, it's such a simple tune as well. So the only chromatic in it is not in the melody itself, but in the accompaniment, this chord seven. And 
I think it'd be worth talking about the accompanying parts just for a moment, because um, although the melody is absolutely gorgeous, the accompanying parts as well are equally lovely. So if we look at the alto part, um, starting from the beginning, you could see that it also moves largely by step, and it has these beautiful details, such as the syncopation on the word lassen. And this, I think, really helps to drive the arrangement forward. Yeah, again, what we're talking about is when one part is singing a long note, another part is singing, landing on notes between the starts of the other part's notes. To go along with that, if you, at the bottom of that, um, while the alto is doing its syncopation on Dich Lassen, the bass has something interesting, just a little melodic flourish on the same word, Lassen. But then, a few bars later, the alto gets in on the act and echoes it. And it's those subtle little details which tie it together. Again, if we look at the tenor part just here, the way it rises to that wonderful flattened seventh. So in the ordinary major mode in modern contemporary music, the seventh is a leading tone. It pushes up to the tonic. But in the older modal system, it is often flattened. And this gives a completely different character. And this E flat, which appears in both the tenor and the bass, helps to really give this piece its modal identity. Let's go ahead and listen to that sure. so people can hear what it is we're talking about right here. And this is on this, essentially the B phrase of the melody. So this chord, it's the only place in the music where there is an accidental in any part. Absolutely. And doesn't it just sound ravishing? So it really stands out and attracts the attention and really heightens the piece just before the next thing, which is this gorgeously elaborated half cadence to what we would call the dominant, the C major chord at the end of Strassen. But as I say, there's the additional details, the way that the alto echoes what the bass has done a few bars before. This is the bass part. And then the alto part does a similar thing. And in addition, the way that the tenor and the alto cross over, so it's the way the parts intertwine. That again also adds to the subtlety and the beauty of the music. So it's not as if each part has to stay in its own lane, but they can intertwine with each other. And this helps to really bind the texture together. Don't tell that to people who are teaching voice leading, because <laughs> you're not supposed to cross the voices over in voice leading, in, in proper voice leading. But this, this music precedes really the rules that were created to to do, I wouldn't necessarily say proper voice leading, but using you know efficient, the most effective and efficient voice leading works better when you don't cross the lines between one part and another. And in this case, them crossing over adds some beauty and some interest. Yeah. And also, I mean, if we talk about voices crossing over, well, a certain Johann Sebastian Bach somewhere, <laughs> so, some, some fellow by that name, I mean, he was known to cross over lines from time to time, you know, but, you know, well, he never made it big in music, did he? <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and also... There is a danger because if you cross over unskillfully, then it can end up obscuring the voices and just making a mess of the harmony. In this case, the lines, it's the line of each part that works. The line of each part is something singable and understandable for the person who's singing it. Absolutely. And it's the combined harmonies as, as those lines interact you still end up with the, all of the notes together landing on the chords in a beautiful way and in a, in a nicely structured way. So it doesn't end up interfering and it doesn't end up being something that sounds out of place. Rather, it ends up being enjoyable and sounding natural because the people are each singing a line while they are still landing in the right, the right harmonies. Absolutely. I mean, you've hit the nail absolutely on the head there. And I think the particular 
source of the beauty there is in the tenor part, the way that it rises to this flattened seventh with the dotted note preceding it, that just little injection of energy. Ich fahr dohin mein Strassen. Ah, the way that glides up there. Absolutely superb writing. And that's also a mirror of the other lines in the melody itself. Yes, indeed. That upward three notes, downward three notes, an S-shaped curve. We don't get into harmonies, but we also haven't had a piece that we talk about on this podcast yet where it really was a four-part harmony kind of a piece. It's a completely different dimension to add in. We've talked about chords and melody, but we haven't really talked about situations where you have multiple parts playing against each other, but all having to work together. And this is a good example of that. Yeah. And it's, as I say, it shows that you don't have to use an extended tonal vocabulary to achieve fabulous tonal effects. It's simply the simplest tools used with mastery can produce devastatingly expressive music. And I find this really very inspiring indeed. Anything else you'd like to say about this melody? Um, Really, it's just in the course of the last hour or so, just delving into it with you. I've noticed things that I hadn't noticed before. And I think that's, I think, the mark of really great art is the fact that you can keep on coming back to it and find details, little wrinkles in it that you weren't aware of before. It keeps drawing you back. This is, on the surface, a simple tune with very simple harmony with only the one chromatic chord in it. And yet, when you start to unpick it, you find that it is beautifully crafted, not only in the melody, but also in the parts that accompany it. And it's that craftsmanship, attention to detail that really makes it. And I'm sure that um, we could go on for hours and hours with it. But I think it's a real testament to the enormous talent and um, beauty of Heinrich Hiesack's music. And I think it's also a statement looking at the notes we've talked previously about how, especially when a melody is to be sung, that going step by step is an element. And this has steps when you do a leap, very often leaps then turn around and go the other direction. This is following all of those quote unquote rules about writing a melody for voice. And it also does have the rising and falling, you know, the upward and then back down. And it has the kind of technique of not landing at home until the piece has finally arrived at home. This is from now a piece of music that's from 500 years ago. As I say, I think it's also just more than the sum of its parts, because um, until you pointed it out to me, this fact that we're made to wait for the return to the tonic. That idea of waiting to return to the tonic is really, I suppose, the dominant principle, you find the pun there, of tonal music. But again, it ties in with this idea of leaving this beloved place, of leaving one's sweetheart and longing to return again. It does. In this case, the melody starts at home, which is, I think, interesting because a lot of the melodies we've talked about that are longing melodies, looking for something melodies, they don't start at the first note. They start someplace else. And then finally, eventually they get to home or they start in the middle of the scale and they will go past the note, but it never lands on the, the main chord. And that's, you know, that is, I think, part of our, our cultural and traditional musical language that we have in terms of resolution, being in a comfortable place is landing on the main note of the main key that we are in on that main chord. And that is just in terms of the language of Western music, that is a resolution and that is arriving at home. Sure. I suppose, although there's always something more to discover with it, I think there is an elusive quality about it. And that, I think, is really appealing. The fact that you can't quite put your finger on it. The thing that really gives this sense of bittersweet longing You can almost get there through analysis, but there's also something which defies description that will always slip away when you try to pin it down. I think that the human interaction, the human reaction 
to a melody and to the sound of chords and so forth. Those things, there is something that you can't describe in the experience of that. How do you describe the flavor of cinnamon? You know, you know what the flavor of cinnamon, and it's unique. And it gives you emotional context because you've had cinnamon in certain circumstances in your life. And so there's all this stuff around that flavor. Melody is like the the compound or the the chemical that makes the flavor of cinnamon. It's a it's these atoms all arranged in a particular order, or it's a combination of different things that come together. And to our senses, they give a flavor, they give an experience. But our own interaction with that then adds another layer of emotion on top of that. How do you describe those things? How do you say, oh, I can tell you exactly what cinnamon tastes like, or I can tell you exactly what garlic tastes like. You can't. And so the experience, that mystery of how does this, this sounds like something and this feels like something as I listen to it, it's, it is, there is a mystery to it. And thank God for that. I mean, it's a bit like trying to describe what consciousness is. You know, you can say, well, consciousness Mm. is entirely the product of the brain, but then where is it precisely? (laughs) And again, I think this is the difference and why as a composer, I'm not particularly worried about artificial intelligence because you can program a computer to ape a style, to copy a style. For example, I heard a reconstruction of Beethoven's 10th symphony, where the computer had taken Beethoven's sketches and then had completed the 10th symphony. And it sort of sounds like Beethoven, but really it just sounds like a mishmash of motifs and ideas from Beethoven's music. But it doesn't really sound like Beethoven truly. It doesn't have that message, that sense of trying to say something, trying to communicate something. Because a computer without a will, without a consciousness of its own, can't. Whereas we as composers, we can express our emotions. And even though there's no kind of language which will precisely express what I'm feeling, and then there's no way to guarantee that you'll receive it in the same way that I felt it, and vice versa, nevertheless, there is something there, something driving it, but a computer doesn't have that. We have the the language of music that we have been building and sharing on for hundreds of years now that uses certain techniques and certain methods and certain chord progressions and harmonies to mean different things. And it does have the tonal structure and the tonal functionality of different chords doing different things. So there is a commonality to messages in general, but you can say words and have somebody interpret words differently with exactly the same words. And the same thing happens with music. Exactly. I mean, again, the fact that this is in what we would perceive as a major key, and yet it's such a sad song. And it sounds sad. It sounds bittersweet sad. So it's not like a miserable sad, but it's still a sad song, but it's in the major key. So it kind of almost defies conventional thinking about emotion. But it works. And that is really marvelous. And I've been fascinated with this melody for many, many years and still learning new things about it. And I hope that I'll carry on learning new things about it forever. (laughs) Well, let's go ahead and take a break and we will come back and talk about your music. Okay. Welcome back to the Melodology Podcast, celebrating the unsung excellence of melody makers. My name is Arthur Brewer. I am your host, and I am here today with Tamsin Jones. Tamsin, thank you for being here today. Let's get to your show and tell. Tell us what you have brought for us to listen to today. Well, thank you, first of all, again, for having me on on the podcast. I'm really enjoying the experience. And um, I'd like to talk about my composition, Noel, Verbum Caro Factum Est. Let's Go ahead and listen to that, and then we can talk about it. Okay.
That is really beautiful. Thank you. So tell us about this piece. Okay, well, it's a game of two halves. I remember that I got up one morning and I had the urge to compose something. As, as one as you does. Know. <laughs> and as you know, I'm very interested in the 15th and 16th century music. On your own website, one of the things you say in your introduction to yourself is that your mission is to bring a 21st century edge to historic styles, combining techniques in a seamless way while offering surprises and contrasts. And from my experience of Renaissance music and 21st century music or 20th century music, it was a really nice mix in that piece of music to have the syncopations, the way that you have the syncopations, the rhythms coming in and in some cases, almost a little bit of a pop sensibility to some of the lines Mm. of the music, while still having this very traditional sounding choral arrangement. I think that it it wasn't something I was thinking about consciously, but I have a theory about where it may have come from. So I was was trying to compose a Noel in the style of Bunoir, who was a 15th century French composer, Burgundian composer, I should say, of the slightly older generation to Josquin. And um, I liked his Noel very much, but then I came out with my own Noel refrain, but what I came out with had this kind of groove to it. And I was kind of wondering where it came from, but then I remembered that about 12 or so years ago, I had taught myself how to play the bass guitar. And one of the techniques that I'd learned was the idea of playing in eighths steadily, but then syncopating the last eighth of each bar. So, like that. And I suppose that must have been playing in my subconscious mind at some level, and that's that's perhaps where it where it came from. And so I think that's I guess is the the advantage of exposing oneself to lots of different styles of music because you never know when two completely different ideas will suddenly <laughs> knit together in a way that just works. And I was so thrilled to find that. So I had this Noel refrain, but then I didn't know what to put with it. So I first of all tried to set the words of Odier Christus Natus Est, but I just couldn't make it work. It just didn't didn't fit. So I put it on the back burner and left it for six months. At the time, I was living as a lodger in somebody else's house, and it was midsummer, and they were having a barbecue, and the noise was driving me frantic. So to get away from it, I thought, what I'll do is I'll put on my headphones and I'll do some composition to distract myself. And I found a text called This Night a Child is Born in a collection of English carol lyrics that was compiled by the scholar Edith Rickard. And I thought, oh, that'll work. And I came up with a melody for it. And it just went well with the Noah refrain, and that's that's how it came to be. So, thank goodness my landlord decided to have a barbecue on that day, because <laughs> it gave me the motivation to escape from it by composing a piece of music. So that's that's how it came to be. You have another one. What would you like to do next? I think on the subject of both Heinrich Isaac and uh, Josquin, I think um, the Ave Maria would be a good choice because it's actually based on the melody in Spruch ich muss dich lassen, 
And this is by the choir known as the choir Matthew known Curtis. as Matthew Curtis. So a one person choir.
wow, just another <laughs> beautiful piece. And it was really enjoyable having just explored Innsbruck to hear that same melody used in this piece as part of, you know, part of your reference to Isaac. Thank you. I wanted to pay tribute both to Isaac and to Joscan, and I did it in a slightly um, roundabout way because with the Innsbruck tune, I stated it in very long note values in the first bass part and then put it backwards in the second bass part and then they kind of meet in the middle. So that is a retrograde canon. I did fudge it a little. The second half is composed by me so that it would fit with the backwards version so that you could make a retrograde canon of it. So that was kind of a structural foundation for the piece. So the tune Innsbruck and then a kind of bit added on that would fit with the backwards version and then you could flip it round. Then the top parts are entirely in canon. So there are, I think, eight pairs of canons sorry, four pairs of canons to make eight voices constructed around this. So this, I suppose I was trying to out Joscan Joscan because there is a famous piece, the third on your stay from the Missa Lomarme Sexti Tony, where he takes the melody Lomarme and he takes the entire melody and then states it as a retrograde canon without fudging it, really, really cleverly done. And that was his structural foundation. And then he has four other parts in canons above that. So by writing more voices, I'm sort of trying to outdo him a little bit. <laughs> I feel a bit um, silly now trying to outdo Joscan, but that's what I was up to. But the style of it is heavily influenced by that um, On Your Stay by Joscan but using this melody by Henrik Isaac. So I was trying to pay homage to both composers because I feel that often Henrik Isaac is slightly underestimated because um, of a famous story about him. So in 1502, both Shoskan and Isaac were competing for the post of composer to Ercole d'Este, the Duke of Ferrara. And the secretary knew both composers and wrote a famous memorandum in which he says essentially, well, it is true that Joscan composes better, but Heinrich Isaac gets along better with his fellows. And furthermore, Isaac asks for only 120 ducats to compose, whereas Joscan asks for 200. And what's more, Isaac will write you a piece when you want it, whereas Joscan will only compose when he feels like it. <laughs> and so despite this, despite this secretary trying to nudge Duke Hercules, Ercole, into appointing Isaac, he actually chose Joscan. So this, I think, maybe has led to a slightly negative view of Isaac because he was the runner-up. But at the end of the day, to be the runner-up to Joscan, there's no shame in that, you know? <laughs> and Isaac was a magnificent composer in his own right, as we have seen with Innsbruck Ich muss die Klassen. And there are many other fine pieces. So just to cite one example, there's the motet um, Virgo Prudentissima, which was written for the Feast of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary in, I think, 1507. And it was written for a grand imperial occasion at the court of Maximilian I, the Holy Roman Emperor. And so it combines a prayer to the Virgin with prayers for the protection of the empire. And it is a tremendous piece, which it's like a train coming along. It continually builds up momentum. So it contrasts blocks of six-part harmony, which move slowly in a very majestic way, with duos which move melismatically, intertwiningly, and in a very fluid and supple way. And there's this constant contrast, but it gradually accumulates energy and it explodes into a really memorable climax with interlocking ostinatos. 
as both the Virgin Mary and the Emperor are praised simultaneously. And I think this is a wonderful piece and a really good example of what a superb craftsman and contrapuntist Heinrich Isaac was. And this is just one of many tremendous pieces by him, another one being Optime Pastor, another six-part motet, which again works its way to a really stunning climax. And I think to judge him on the basis of one memorandum and one decision by Duke Hercules of Ferrara, I think is a bit unfair. I think when you encounter his music, you see that if he has to be second to Josquin, it was only a very close second. And furthermore, Isaac had a really wide variety of styles. So no less a person than Duke Lorenzo de Medici writes that one of Isaac's best qualities is his ability to write music in different styles. So I think he's a composer who really commands respect and deserves attention. And so I wanted to pay tribute to both of these wonderful composers in my own way. Well, I am so thankful you, first of all, brought the melody to my attention and that we got to listen to you know, a piece of music, again, 500 years old, but we can still connect with it and we can still see the brilliance in it and we can still see the techniques and the unsung excellence, as it were, of the craft that went into creating the melody itself for this music. And we're going to have a ton of links in the show notes for this podcast, because there are so many pieces of music that I want to make sure we have links to so people can listen to them and hear this really amazing and beautiful moving music that I would say the great majority of people nowadays have probably not heard much Renaissance music. So this is the kind of thing where listening to it, it opens up your experiences. It gives you new, beautiful things to listen to. And they are treasures that I think more people need to be aware of, and they should be shared and celebrated. Sure, absolutely. I mean, if this wins over more fans to the music of Isaac and to Josquin, then I would be absolutely delighted. And oh, enter the music of Jones. Yes, I wouldn't be averse to that either. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much for sharing you your absolutely beautiful music. It's been a joy. And thank you again thank you. for bringing an, a melody that I would not have picked myself, but that's part of why I really enjoy having guest composers on, and it's been a delight having you on the podcast today. How can people find you online? Okay, I have a website, tumsinjones.co.uk. And I also have um, a YouTube channel. I do go onto Twitter, but I try very strictly to restrict the amount of time that I spend there because um, the trouble is with Twitter is you see people arguing about one thing or another and it's just depressing. But exactly. Twitter undeniably is a useful way of publicizing the message and of um, letting people know about one's music, and it's, enough, it's a way of communicating with, with other composers and musicians. But I think modern technology, we are still learning how to use it so that it benefits us. And oftentimes, I think it is, is dangerous to us. So I, yeah. I, I find that with Twitter especially, I have to be careful. It's times in Gen 17. Yeah, well, it's staying within the community. I always find with Twitter that staying within the music community and then going in with the intention of lifting other people up and connecting sure. with other people specifically in the new music community, that that makes Twitter tolerable. And it actually, Twitter is, in terms of the new music community on Twitter, it's quite amazing. The internet is still something that's very powerful, but like all new technologies, we have to learn to use it and not be abused by it. And right. I think eventually, as we master the internet, I think it can be a really positive place. I mean, just look at us, me in Newcastle upon Tyne, and you in America, and we're talking easily in real time. It's wonderful, really wonderful. It is amazing, but it is so new. It's going to take, I think it's going to take us as as a species and as cultures to adjust to the amount of communication and the the freedom of communication that we have as well. Yeah. I mean, just just in that connection, I read a book recently by Carl Newport called Deep Work. 
And I found, yeah, that really is right on the money. It's the ability to essentially focus on the things that are important, to think carefully about how you use your time, and to avoid those online experiences and distractions that just take value away from life. But um, I think if you go in anywhere with the intention of lifting up other people, of encouraging, supporting, and being positive, then I think that really reflects back and makes everybody happier and brings value to everyone's life. And so I think I'm an optimist. And of course, I met you through Twitter as well, because I put the request out for this, you know, for what melodies would you like to discuss on the Melodology podcast? So Twitter, you know, even though Twitter has this kind of evil side to it, this dark side to it, it still is what brought the the two of us together to be able to do this podcast. On Twitter, I am Arthur Brewer. Brewer is spelled B-R-E-U-R. It's just five letters, and the last three letters look like the beginning of the word Europe. I'm Arthur Brewer on everything, including my website. This is the Melodology Podcast, which is melodologypodcast.com. And on all the social media, it's just Melody Podcast. Remember, you can be a Patreon supporter and see the video of this presentation. And that will not only help out the podcast, but gives you the opportunity to see what it is that we're talking about. Thank you again very much, Tamsin. Thank you very much, Arthur. I really enjoyed myself. And thank you so much for having me on the podcast. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for joining us in the Melodology podcast, celebrating the unsung excellence of Melody Makers. Come back and join us for the next podcast.